reading comes from Julian of Norwich's Revelations of Love, chapter 15. I saw that God took great spiritual delight in my soul. Because of that, I felt so strong, so spiritual, that I was completely at ease. My laughter and delight only lasted for a short while. Then I found myself changed. I felt abandoned, depressed, weary of life. But after a while, God gave me comfort again, so that I felt no fear, no depression, no physical or spiritual pain. Then again, the depression, then the delight. First one, then the other, I suppose about 20 times. When I was feeling joy, I could have said with St. Paul, nothing can separate me from the love of Christ. When I was depressed, I could have said with St. Peter, Lord, save me, I am dying. I knew joy one moment and pain the next. I was given this experience for a reason. Sometimes God leaves us on our own for the good of our soul. Sometimes God brings us joy and sometimes pain, but both are one love. Joy lasts, but pain is passing. God doesn't want us to feel pain, but wants us to pass right by that pain and live in God's endless love. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not withhold his own son, but gave him up for all of us, will he not with him also give us everything else? Who will bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? It is Christ Jesus, who died, yes, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. When Reed was little, one of our favorite groups to listen to and the first concert I took Reed to was Peter, Paul, and Mary. And it's on my phone, so when I'm listening to my music, this song comes on. And it always makes me think of Reed because it's about a father saying something to his son. It's called Day is Done. Tell me why you're crying, my son. I know you're frightened like everyone. Is it the thunder in the distance you fear? Will it help if I stay very near? I am here. And if you take my hand, my son, all will be well when the day is done. And if you take my hand, my son, all, be, all will be well when the day is done. All will be well. This week, we're spending time with the mystic Julian of Norwich. 
So I want to tell you a little bit about Julianne of Norwich. She was around during the 1300s. In fact, she was present on earth when the bubonic plague swept through Europe and the Hundred Year War was happening. And during that time, we don't know what caused it or what led to it, but she decided to become an anchoress. Now, an anchoress is this thing that we don't have now, um, but what would happen is that a person would pledge themselves to the church to pray continually for the church, and they would be anchored to the church meaning that they would build this little room, a 12 by 12 room, with a window that looked into the worship space and a window that looked out into the world. And they would take the person, the woman, and place her in this 12 by 12 room. And in there, they would do this ritual recognizing her death, that she was going back to be dust to dust and seal her into the room. And in that room, her vocation, her calling was to pray for the community, to pray for the people that had enclosed her into that room. She spent the rest of her life in that space. So we don't know much about Julian of Norwich. What we know is that she was the first female published author in English. We don't know her name because her name, Julia of Norwich, is the name of the church where she was anchored to. What we do know is that she lived through a time that was horrible. A time where over half the population of her town and half of the priests in her village were killed by the plague. It was a time when there were revolts by the peasants because there had been too much blood, sweat, and tears taken out of their lives. They had been taxed to the limit of what they could handle. They were rebelling against the upper class. And it was the time of war, where the countries were fighting with each other. But the greatest fear was that bubonic plague. Because they often discussed how the priest who came to say the last rites would end up in the grave with the person he had given the last rites to. Because if you touched or were in contact with anybody with the plague, you got the plague. So there's great speculation about Julian of Norwich that maybe her entire family was killed by the plague and so she decided to devote herself to prayer and was willing to anchor herself to the church. But what we have of Julian is her writing. And her writings began with visions from God that she wrote down. She wrote down these visions and then she lived into them for the next 30 years. And one of the things she wrote in her visions was, all shall be well. That was an answer to her question, what, why did God not prevent sin? For then all would be well. There be deeds of evil done in our sight, and so great harms taken, that it seemeth to us that it were impossible that ever it should come to good end, the great deed ordained, by which our Lord shall make all things well. Our good Lord said, all things shall be well. And another time God said, thou shalt see thyself that all manner of things shall be well. He willeth we know that not only he taketh heed to noble things and to be great, to great, but also to little and to small, to low and to simple, to one and to the other. And so meaneth he in that he saith, 
All manner of things shall be well. For he will if we know that the least thing shall not be forgotten. For like all the blissful trinity made all things of nothing bright, so the same blessed trinity shall make well all that is not well. She tells a story that when she was having one of these visions, God showed to her something small, something small and round, about the size of a hazelnut. So I thought I would put on the small round earrings that I have. They're a little bit bigger than a hazelnut, but they're the size of the world. And she said that this nut, this image that she showed, that God showed her was small and round as a ball. And as she looked upon it, her eye and her understanding and her thought, she wondered what it could be. And God said, it is all that is made. She wondered about this marveled at it. For how could so great what has all that has been made be so small? How that is all that is made so tiny it lasts and ever shall for God loves it. She saw three things in this little ball. The first is that God made it, the second that God loves it, and the third that God keeps it. But what is this to me? Truly the creator, the keeper, the lover, for till I am substantially one to him, I may never have full rest nor be at true bliss. That is to say, until I be so fast to him that there is nothing that is made between me and God and me. The little things, the little things. She saw that little thing and she learned about the love of God. That's why in the passage that I read to you earlier, she was going through waves and cycles, waves of joy and waves of distress, a feeling of joy and expectation and hope and a feeling of distress and depression and loneliness, wave upon wave, joy and distress, joy and distress. And into that, what she came to realize that there are always those moments, that there will be moments of joy and happiness, beauty and peace, and there will be moments of distress and loneliness, depression, anxiety, and that what we find in those moments is that God was there, whether it was in the high of the joy or the low or the depression, that God was there saying to us, all shall be well. All shall be well. Pardon me when I hear those words say, this isn't the time to say that to you, to say to you, all shall be well. Because right now, we don't know if all will be well. We don't know what comes next. We know right now that there is a lot of anxiety. As so we see the number of COVID cases rising across the nation in places where they thought they had done a good job and it has exploded again. In places where we thought they had done a bad job and it exploded again, that this disease is taking over and controlling our lives and our economy. And how in the midst of that do we say all shall be well? And maybe what we're saying or experiencing when we say that is a sense not that everything will be fixed and perfect and beautiful right now. Not that all shall be well and someone we know is going to die 
of cancer this week. We say all shall be well, because for what us, what it means is that God is there. And sometimes we whisper those words, all shall be well, because we need to hear them to help us get through the next moment, the next hour, the next day, the next week. We whisper, all shall be well, to encourage us to keep going, to continue on, to remember that God is there, to remember that there is nothing, nothing in our creation, neither height nor depth, neither angels or devils, nothing, nothing that can separate us from the love of God. And so there are moments where we whisper all shall we well because we need that comfort. We need that comfort from the song that reminds me of Reed all the time. Do you ask me why I'm singing, my son? You shall inherit what mankind has done. In a world filled with sorrow and woe, if you ask me why this is so, I really don't know. And if you take my hand, my son, all will be well when the day is done. And if you take my hand, my son, all will be well when the day is done. Because there are days when to proclaim all will be well, all shall be well, all manner of things shall be well. Seems like arrogance. Seems like we are trying to push down and damp down the fear and the anxiety and the depression. It seems too heavy. How can we proclaim all shall be well when there are those who are grieving loved ones. Where there are those who are grieving loved ones who have died from COVID-19, knowing that if we had just done things differently here in the United States, if we had done things differently, we wouldn't have over 100,000 people dead and more every day. But we didn't do things differently. So how can we say all shall be well to doctors and nurses and EMS personnel and others who are overwhelmed and exhausted, who've put their own health and life and well-being at risk to care for patients? Or how do we say all shall be well all the unemployed in this country right now, to all those right at this moment who are fearful of how they will pay the rent, of when they will lose the place they are living, of how they will make a mortgage payment, of what they will do to feed their family. How can we say to them, all shall be well? The list goes on and on. How do we say to people who are lonely, who are tired of being at home and are at home alone, that all shall be well? The list of all the things that aren't well right now. The list of all the things that aren't well. The things that have been brought to our attention that we knew but didn't know the daily racist indignities that we perpetuate on one another, the history that we thought was shiny and pretty and white and beautiful was painful and dark and bloody for others. How do we proclaim all shall be well when we're faced with a world where it doesn't seem like all will be well. And maybe that's why in those moments, we have those scripture passages. The passages that tell us that there is nothing that can separate us from God. Whether we are in the highest heights or the lowest lows, whether we are the happiest we've ever been or whether we are in the pits of despair. 
whether we feel small and insignificant, whether we feel left behind and left out, or whether we feel like we've got it all. In those moments, we as the church, we proclaim to the world that God is always there. God is there in your pit and in your joy. God is there when you are living high and happy. And God is there when you are feeling depressed and anxious. And Julia teaches us this. Because when she first wrote her vision of love, it was really short. It was just a description of what she had seen and experienced and the words that Jesus had gave to her. But over the next 30 years, she took that vision. And when she went back and read what she had originally wrote, that first draft, she expanded on it. She told more stories, explained in depth what she had seen and experienced. She took what something that was small and expanded it to be much greater. And maybe that's why we read these passages of scripture that tell us that all things shall be well. Maybe that's why we read and say over and over again that nothing can separate us from the love of God. Nothing can separate us. It doesn't matter what church people have done. It doesn't matter what your family has done. It doesn't matter that they have been the worst you could have ever experienced. In trying to teach you about God and your place in the world. That they don't have the last word. That the words of the Bible that have been used to hurt are the words that we're to proclaim. We're to proclaim the God who says that there's nothing that separates you from me. Or as Julian of Norwich says, all shall be well. All manner of things shall be well. Jesus didn't say, as Julian says, you shall not be perturbed, you shall not be troubled, you shall not be distressed. But what he said was you shall not be overcome. We say all shall be well because sometimes we need to hear it ourselves. And sometimes our friends and family need to hear it. And sometimes a stranger needs to hear it. That's why we say all shall be well. Tell me why you're smiling, my son. Is there a secret you can tell everyone? Do you more know more than men that are wise? Can you see what we all must disguise through your loving eyes? And if you take my hand, my son, all will be well when the day is done. And if you take my hand, my son, all will be well when the day is done. I invite you to take someone's hand. And if you have to whisper or if you have to shout it, remind them that all will be well. That there is nothing that can separate them from the love of God.
I invite you to breathe in deeply and to breathe out. I invite you to release the tension in your shoulders, in your back, to breathe in and to release it. And hear these words, all shall be well. All shall be well. I invite you to repeat those words. All shall be well. All shall be well. Rest in those words for a minute. All shall be well. All shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well. Teachers are worried. Parents are worried. Be with parents as they decide how their children will learn this year. Be with school administrators as they make tough decisions. Let nothing disturb you. Let nothing frighten you. Everything passes away except God. All shall be well. And all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well. The unemployed are worried about losing their unemployment insurance. People are having to choose between keeping their vulnerable families safe and going back to work. Be with those who are economically vulnerable, who worry about rent and food and medical bills. Be with all those out of work, working less, working from home. Let nothing disturb you, let nothing frighten you. Everything passes away except God. All shall be well and all shall be well and all manner of things shall be well. So many of us are grieving God. We have lost close friends and family to illness, cancer, old age, and this horrible virus. So many of us are sick with chronic illness, with cancer, with the virus. Be with those who care for their sick, the sick, putting themselves at risk be with the sick and with the grieving. Let nothing disturb you, let nothing frighten you. Everything passes away except God. All shall be well, all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well. Teach us how to stop for a moment, God, and rest. Rest knowing that troubles will come and troubles will go that there will be times when we are lonely and isolated and times when we are full of joy and beauty. And in those moments, remind us that all shall be well. As we pray together the prayer that you taught us, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Cheerful givers do not count the cost of what they give. Their hearts are set on pleasing and cheering the person to whom the gift is given. Let us pray. Loving one, you powerfully fill the voids in our lives. You reveal your compassionate grace by the simple act of always being present. You unselfishly feed us when we are hungry and quietly walk with us when we feel alone. Combine this offering with others so that all of your children can be filled with the power of your redeeming spirit. Amen.
And if nobody told you today that I love you, remember that God loves you and always will, that Jesus loves you and always will, that I love you and always will. And may you remember, all shall be well. All shall be well. All manner of things shall be well for nothing. Nothing in all of creation can separate us from the love of God. Amen.